Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Thomas Metzinger. He is Senior Research Professor at the Department of Philosophy at Johannes Gutenberg University of Mainz, Germany. His research centers on analytic philosophy of mind, applied ethics, philosophy of cognitive science, and philosophy of mind. So, Dr. Metzinger, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you on. Hello. Okay, so uh, let's first talk about uh, consciousness, because this is a big part of your work. So, um, I mean, how do you approach consciousness? Because I've already talked with philosophers of mind about this on the show, and different people have different ideas about consciousness. There are people that think it's an illusion, people that think it's an epiphenomenon. Uh, I, I mean, do you think that it's real in any way? And uh, do you think that it has any sort of a causal power over, I mean, other aspects of our minds and behavior? Well, that's a long story. Um, <clears throat> so you are, have asked what my approach is. You may know that I was one of the people who founded the Association for the Scientific Study of Consciousness 27 mm -hmm. years ago. So part of my approach has been to open analytical philosophy of mind to interdisciplinary cooperation, to cognitive science, neuroscience, and artificial intelligence. That's what I've basically done the last 35 years. Um, I'm approaches. There are different approaches. You may know there for the last two decades, most people in the more serious consciousness community have honed in on the question of um, the neural correlates of consciousness. You may know that 21 years ago, I have edited a collection called Neural Correlates of Consciousness at MIT Press. Um, this was an initiative um, that has created a lot of work in the field. There is now just um, a special issue of a new journal called Philosophy and the Mind Sciences who looks back at the neural correlates of consciousness for the last 20 years. There are some people uh, like Giulio Tononi, who say it's a failed research program. Um, currently, I am, the last two years, I've been trying out a new approach um, <clears throat> called a, a minimal model explanation. So in theory of science, most people, most neuroscience, just think there's only one kind of explanation classical reduction, uh, Hempel-Oppenheim scheme like this. But of course, philosophers know there are many different ways of uh, explaining a phenomenon. And this is itself an area of intense research. And one thing you can do is you can try to create a minimal model of your target phenomenon. Um, on the level of mathematics, that would mean that you <clears throat> subtract everything that's superfluous. For instance, if you had, you were modeling a gas, you were interested in gas laws, and you had a mathematical model of the gas behavior of the gas molecules in a container, you could, for instance, um, subtract the fact that molecules bounce into each other and that they bounce to the wall of the container, and you might still get what you want to have. You find this is not really, um, the, 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 it doesn't belong to the core explanatory factors, obviously, and you can try to make your mathematical model much simpler. This has been tried in other disciplines in physics, and <clears throat> a question I've been asking the last two years is, could there be a minimal model explanation for consciousness? And uh, my working hypothesis is, is that conscious experience can exist without any form of uh, self-consciousness and without time representation, for instance. Also a perspectival without a first-person perspective that is represented in consciousness itself. And um, we've done some research. We have done some conceptual foundations, psychometric studies, trying um, 
to prepare for interdisciplinary research programs that ask the question, I don't know if you've ever asked yourself the question, Ricardo, what is the simplest state of consciousness? Um, and of course, this is philosophically deep water. Um, how do you define simplicity? Uh, what are our criteria for minimality? If we want to claim, like I do, there's a form of minimal phenomenal experience. This is not <clears throat> mainly an empirical issue. It's a conceptual issue. Uh, what makes a form of phenomenal character, say, maximally simple? And I'll just end this just to give you an idea. The question I have been asking writing a book about it also the last um, um, uh, two years is, does awareness itself have a phenomenal character? So if you consciously perceive, say, a red apple on the table, um, does the consciousness of it all have a phenomenal character? And there are there's a lot of uh, different views on that. And I'm going about this in an empirical way. Right. Uh, in, in your work, I read about pure consciousness. Mm -hmm. what, is, what is that? Yeah, I would like to know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> so, of course, we have, especially in Eastern philosophy, we have more than two and a half thousand years terms for pure consciousness. And there are philosophical theories of mind, which most people in the West don't know, which are also based on introspective experience by scholar practitioners. Uh, many centuries ago, people who intensely practiced meditation and did, for instance, Buddhist philosophy. There are centuries of very intricate and complex philosophical debates there. And there are a number of candidate concepts, for instance, Rigpa or the Dhammakaya or um, the old concept from the Upanishad, Satchitananda, pure awareness, bliss. Um, there is the Tibetan concept of Yeshe, um, bare naked uh, awareness. So we have a range of conce concepts <clears throat> in another philosophical concept, uh, culture who say, Yes, there can be conscious experience without content, as it is usually translated. And there have been discussions in the West, the first edited collection, 1991, with Oxford U University Press, um, uh, by Robert Foreman on pure consciousness. There was a discussion, and this discussion is just starting again. Um, now then the question is, what does the purity consist in? So um, I think there are pure consciousness experiences and we have just published a major psychometric study which took more than two years, which shows that people from 57 countries um, say they have to be precise 3% um, of them say they do not understand the concept of pure consciousness and 3% of them say um, this is uh, an experience they do not know consciousness as such. But all the rest of them, regular meditators of course, um, say two things. They know the experience, that can describe the phenomenology, and if asked the question, do you think this is the most simple? form of consciousness that exists. You get a median of 80, uh, where people say, yes, that is exactly the most simple form of conscious experience. But then it gets really philosophically interesting because you have a small subpopulation who say, no, 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 this is not an experience. You have people who have not studied philosophy who say, no, 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 this is not phenomenal, this is noumenal. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there are intricacies there, but we have clear empirical evidence um, that um, thousands of people 
think they can experience non-conceptually the phenomenal character of awareness as such, but non-conceptually. And that's uh, one of the things I'm interested in uh, right now, what that means. My personal view is I'm a very boring, old-fashioned representationalist. Uh, I uh, think it actually is a form of content. And I think that no form of conscious experience is ever contentless. And that that is also true of phenomenality itself, if it is consciously experienced. Right. Uh, so when we study disruptions of consciousness, what can mm -hmm. we learn about it? Well, <clears throat> If you look into my publications, I've done this for a long time. Um, one thing that is helpful for philosophers, this has now been done, people have picked up on this for more than two decades, is you can show that certain uh, conceptual intuitions, intuitions about what is possible, what is necessary, what is impossible, are actually false. Um, that um, to give an example, a paper I really liked long ago, Crane and Pianta Nida, 1981, uh, on seeing reddish green and yellowish blue. Mm -hmm. um, there are philosophers, I think Thomas Reed, who have said that there are logically inconsistent color predicates, so that no human being, for instance, is able to see a homogeneous patch of color which is green and red at the same time there's so to speak there's no possible world in that in which that could happen mm -hmm. and i find empirical uh, research so ex enormously heuristically fruitful because it explodes these intuitions because these people 40 years ago they stabilized for instance a red and a green bar on the retina with an eye tracker and then arts professors, painters, and normal people suddenly said, wow, I see a color I have never seen before. Mm -hmm. Or if you think at, about Paul Churchland's experiments with chimerical colors, uh, that paper he has written, if you ask questions, can you see a dark blue that's darker than any blue people can see, it, it sounds, illogical, but you can do things with superimposing after images on color experiences. And there are many, many cases where empirical research has just exploded things where philosophers for centuries have thought these are necessary truths. Just think of the dramatic developing development in all this whole field of mind wandering and uh, spontaneous task unrelated thought. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not going into any technical details and data here, but it very clearly shows that for more than two thirds of your conscious lifetime, you have no control over your own thought processes. You are constantly ambushed. Uh, this whole idea of cognitive agency of an actively thinking self, an epistemic agent that is in control, is just empirically refuted. But of course, <laughs> philosophers <laughs> will keep talking for a few decades. <laughs> I think that was the case. Yeah. Um, you better ask me. So if you look into my publications, I've looked long before it became fashionable into schizophrenia, ownership for thoughts, um, Cotard syndrome, where people claim with, you know, we all know Car Descartes, mm -hmm. who claimed that he himself was certain about his own existence. But then you have Cotard patients who claim with the same degree of certainty that they do not exist. Uh, right. Not only that they are dead, there are certain kinds of um, uh, psychotic delusions where you have people who are else around that pretty rational, I think one says interlocutors in English, rational people to talk to, 
but they just defenders claim that they are dead or that they don't even exist. And um, I thought that was all, always thought these things are interesting and you can learn a lot as a philosopher. Right. Is there any way for us to be sure that species apart from humans also have consciousness? Well, we don't have a theory of consciousness, hmm. so we don't. Possibly, according to some theory, we are not conscious ourselves. I mean, we have this, I think the fundamental um, problem has been named by philosophers uh, more than 30 years ago. The explanandum is not clear. It is for the scientists. Um, I still remember when I went to lunch with Nobel laureate Francis Crick in San Diego, and I always told him he wanted to, you know, he said, little boy, just shut up if you want to make a contribution as a philosopher. We're going to kill this thing with consciousness in the next 20 years, and you invented this, you've made no progress, uh, philosophers. Please just shut up. And I just got him very angry, angry by just asking him, what is it, Francis, that you want to explain? So you, we have a lot of noise and activity in the neuroscience community, of course. But if you just simply ask people what their explanandum is when they make bold claims about consciousness, often it just crumbles uh, to pieces. They are not able to say what the target of explanation is. And you have a mirror image of this, of course, in philosophy. People who hold on to this psychological umbrella, uh, um, folk psychological umbrella term, consciousness. And as long as you hold on to this term, then you can do all kinds of stunts and tricks. You can do metaphysics and, and all the folkloristic debates we have about the hard problem and panpsychism. As long as you have this ill-defined folk psychological term, you can play these games and uh, attract attention and play to audiences. The core problem is really, what is it that we want to know? What's the epistemic goal? And I'm afraid maybe we haven't made so much progress there. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned panpsychism. And recently, there are a few philosophers that brought it back to the table. I had, for example, Philip Goff on the show. What do you think about it? Do you think that it makes well, sense? In I, I shouldn't say uh, anything because I do not follow these debates mm -hmm. at all. And most people in the consciousness community don't follow these metaphysical debates. So mm -hmm. I cannot really comment. Of course, it's a time-honored old position. It returns from time to time in philosophy. Uh, it's, it's, of course, interesting in its own right, so to fear, uh, speak, but I think one thing is perhaps helpful. There's a metaphysics of panpsychism. It can be a metaphysical claim. But what most people don't see is, is that there all, is also a phenomenology of panpsychism. For um, I hold that actually for every possible metaphysical position <laughs> philosophers have come up with, there is at least one altered state of consciousness, a phenomenological configuration of which it could be the mapping, if you want to uh, put it like this. So, of course, there is an experience of everything being um, conscious, consciousness, and everything being in consciousness. Uh, and there is a phenomenology of idealism. Just this morning, I'm sitting here, I have 1,183 verbal reports of meditators, and I have sorted them into 36 categories. And of course, there is a robust and highly interesting experience of not me being in the world, um, but me being the 
phenomenal space in which all this happen, happening and the little person just being a part of it, me being the conscious space in which all of this arises, this phenomenology has, to, has been known for centuries. Um, and I think the attraction of panpsychism debates, why, why, is it, why it is so good for your career to talk about panpsychism, is because it attracts a lot of interest. There are spiritual people who have who see that there might be something there that maps onto very interesting states of consciousness. There is the psychedelic crowd, the psychonauts, who have had experiences, panpsychism pan experiences on psychoactive substances, but are in desperate need for an explanation. They find nobody and no serious books um, um, who tell them what it is they have been experiencing when suddenly everything was consciousness um, uh, on a substance they had taken or on a longer meditation retreat. And of course, the third thing is, I have this hypothesis, you will be, to put it a little crudely, you will be the more successful as a philosopher, the more you manage to open little back doors for mortality denial. <laughs> so if you come up with um, a theory that has some little anti-reductionist back door, something not too ancient, of course, not classical theology or something like that, but which has this flavor of there might be a way out of the physicalist worldview here. That speaks one to one of our deepest emotional needs, um, which is mortality denial. And that is why all these uh, metaphysical discussions that surround consciousness research are so interesting for many people. They are not actually interested in progress on consciousness they're interested in finding little back doors or possibilities for mortality night, uh, a denial that everything might in the end be completely different from how it looks. And this is not to take anything um, away from people who seriously discuss panpsychism. That's all fine. But that's why this comes up again and again and again, and why it draws so much attention. It speaks to deep, be, uh, deep emotional needs in us, I think. Okay. But again, uh, I'm not following this debate, so I cannot comment on any recent publications. Mm -hmm. Right, fair enough. Do you think there's any room for solipsism? <sighs> if I could only understand it, so... <clears throat> Again, if I look at the reports I have in my current study, which I am processing, there is a rare phenomenology of solipsism. There are people who sometimes feel as if they are the only self-conscious entity in the whole universe, in some sense. That's a possible kind of experience being the only self in reality. Mm -hmm and also everything else in a sense being within me, if that can be an interpretation of solipsism too. There are phenomenologies um, that mirror this. As a philosophical thesis, what does it mean to produce evidence for something? I think this necessarily has to take place in a social context, in a community of philosophers or researchers or a scientific community, which X hypothesis does not exist. So um, <clears throat> that's why I say I'm not sure if I understand your question in the first place. What would it mean <clears throat> to show that solipsism is correct? To whom would you show this? Would there be a possibility that it might be false? I have this thought experiment. I, one time I've written a non-academic book, which is called The Ego Tunnel, 
and which is um, it's a really it's it's dangerous if you do that because then all your colleagues are too lazy to read your real work, the peer-reviewed work, and read this little thing that has been mutilated by American editors and uh, and say, ah, oh, yeah, I just read this easy thing, I know how the guy ticks. But in, in that book, uh, <clears throat> there is a lucid dream a thought experiment. Imagine you have a lucid dream, and in that lucid dream, you are on a conference of dream researchers and um, you tell them, listen, all of you, you don't exist. You are just figures, dream characters in my dream. And then they just burst out in, laugh, in, laughter, uh, in laughter. You know, that's the solipsism problem. I say, no, 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 no. I own this body. I own this brain. This is a lucid dream. You are my dream characters. And then they say, well, um, <clears throat> show it to us, show it to us. And uh, then you say, okay, I can just wake up and you will all disappear uh, and uh, I will remain. And then somebody very clever comes along and says, no, by returning to your level of delusion, you haven't shown anything to anybody on this level of reality. Uh, it may feel like waking up to you, but we are the scientific community this, of which you claim it's only a simulation in your brain. How do you prove it to this community on the level of its reality, epistemological background assumption? And you have a difficulty. And in a way, the solipsist says exactly this. The solipsist says, you're all dream characters in my dream. Right. Um, I once had a problem with an Indian philosopher who argued this against me. Uh, <laughs> and, and what happened there? Well, the funny thing was he argued that he didn't exist. So his thesis was that he was just an illusion in my mind. And <laughs> It, it was a little difficult on that uh, kitchen table for me. Um, but uh, did you think a simulated being could argue for its own, own non-existence? Um, as you may know, I've been involved in ethics of virtual reality and AI quite a bit. We will have um, photorealistic avatars, super good three-dimensional deepfakes very soon that speak natural language. And of course, they can be used as humanoid inter, uh, interfaces that an AI that itself is unconscious and has no personal level properties could use to speak with us. So um, what would you do if you had an intelligent avatar uh, that argued it, it didn't exist really? It was just an interface. But at the same time, you didn't know if not one of your student friends was currently embodying that avatar and really speaking um, uh, to you through this persona, through this virtual mask. So we will very soon in, in advanced VR settings, we will confront this problem that we have simulations of other selves that speak natural language. And we have that problem. Is there anybody in quote unquote behind it? And uh, that's actually a deep epistemological problem. Um, how do I know um, that you are behind the image I see on my screen right now? And the next step from that is, of course, how do you know that about yourself? Um, that is where it gets philosophically interesting. I don't know if you, um, this is a long coming around now, but um, imagine hard problem, functional isomorphs are possible. Your functional isomorph um, would of course be cognitively isomorphic to you too. It would have a lot of false memories about who it was and who it is, uh, a lot of false beliefs, 
but on the level of conscious experience, it could never detect it. And it could, for instance, have the belief that it is conscious right now. Uh, you have the belief that you are conscious right now. Your zombie would have that belief too, right? Your functional isomorph in a way, which turns it around is how do you know uh, that you are maybe not only something like a zombie with a false belief about himself, which he will never be able to detect um, because there's this functionally rigid structure. Um, this actually also shows how absurd these discussions are because um, it presumes this Cartesian element that you, because your own mind is epistemically transparent to you, you know that you are conscious right now. But if zombies are possible, you don't know that, you know? And uh, I, 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 do you get the point I'm trying to make? Um, mm -hmm. This is how all of this collapses. And the, the solipsist, to come back to this, how would he or she know all these things? Um, for instance, uh, let's say the thesis is that it, uh, he or she is the sole conscious self in the universe. What epistemic resources would the solipsist have to prove the truth of this to, his, to himself or herself? But you better ask me a question. Uh, I'm beginning to ramble here. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I mean, uh, I would like to move on to another topic now. Okay. Uh, what is the self-model theory of subjectivity? Ah, uh, well, it's... Um, I wrote a German monograph in 1993, uh, which nobody knows. And uh, it's called Subject and Self-Model. I translate the German title. So it's about the relationship between the subject in an epistemological sense and the phenomenology, phenomenological empirical I, if you want to. It has a very long subtitle, which is called Die Perspektivität phenomenaler Zustände vor dem Hintergrund einer naturalistischen Theorie mentaler Repräsentation which means the perspectivalness of phenomenal states against the background of a naturalistic theory of mental representation. That was the original idea. Out of this came this English book, People Know Being No One at MIT Press. Mm -hmm. And the idea was, from my point of view, that consciousness, as you asked in the beginning, is not one problem but it is a whole bundle of problems. Some are philosophical, some are empirical, some are both. I wanted to know what is the most difficult um, philosophical problem in this bundle of problems. And for me, it is clearly what is a first person perspective, right? So this tries to develop a representationalist theory of what it means for an, any information processing system, not only a human being, to have a first person perspective. So that's the question, what is it? And, um, you know, there's this whole thing, are there irreducible first person facts, which can only be known from a first person perspective? And, um, I'm going to say this book is 700 pages. So um, one major claim is that in a metaphysical sense, no such things as selves exist in the world, but that there is, of course, a very rich and robust phenomenology of selfhood. And the major step to explain this is to say that a system can have a self-model that is not a model of a thing that is a self, but a model of the system as a whole, body, affective states, cognitive states, um, social properties. But if that model is phenomenally transparent, the conscious layer of that model cannot be experienced as a model, 
then you get a phenomenology of identification. The system is glued to the content of that self model as if it was, that's false, but as if it would confuse itself with um, um, that internal model it has of itself. And that is not equivalent to a first person perspective, but that's the major, um, uh, so to speak, necessary component for a theory of perspectivalness to have a transparent conscious self model that creates two things, the phenomenology of identification and the phenomenology of selfhood, of being an agent, for instance, and of global ownership. And I've wrote and written a lot about this. And then there's a theory what it means phenomenologically to have a perspective, perspective on the world. That's a very different question from epistemologically, what makes knowledge subjective, but I've created a link. So I have a theory what a consciously experienced first person perspective is. And then the link is to say all facts that are inter internally represented in this internal mode of presentation are subjective facts. So knowing the world under a conscious first person perspective is a mode, a data format, under which certain information processing systems can know the world. There is no metaphysical mystery, but a triumph of biological evolution, if you uh, will, a fantastic neurocomputational achievement in beings like us, that things we know are experienced and made globally available as things that are known by a self. So I think there are different, you know, you have propositional representation of knowledge, you have theories, you have conceptual representation, but long before this existed on the planet, natural evolution created a, a format for presenting knowledge about the world as knowledge of a self. And um, that is basically the idea to understand what subjective experiences are. I wanted to know what subjective means because coming back to consciousness research, I think that's the major obstacle you know if you think i was very fascinated if you think for instance of thomas nagel's 1986 book the view from nowhere chapter four the objective self what does it mean it appears in no neuroscientific theory that states representational states the system has are tied to an individual first person perspective well, I have a story to tell about this. Sure. Uh, would you like to tell us then? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, the second, I now call it an epistemic agent model. Um, our brains sometimes create not only a model of an embodied being, but of an entity that can select goals of knowledge and actively pursue them. A model of an epistemic agent. Sometimes we have one, sometimes we don't. That's the idea, at least. And in the olden days, I made a philosophical point. You know, there is Brentano's problem, 1874, um, the relationship of intentionality. One question, of course, is, is how phenomenal properties are related to intentional properties. The intentional relationship creates, uh, relates a mental act to an intentional object which may not exist, right? So there's, a, an, an, as Margaret Anscombe said, an arrow of intentionality pointing to the intentional object. The point I've made in the book being no one and actually in the 19, in the German book long before is that the brain actually has an internal model of the intentionality relationship. So our experience, we, we don't experience only objects and colors and self, 
but we have a phenomenology of reference. There is actually a phenomenal experience of this term now refers to this object, or this finger points indexically to this object or tries to guide my attention to this object. So there is a phenomenal model of the intentionality relationship itself. That was my point um, um, 30 years ago. There is a non-conceptual uh, phenomenal representation of what much later in the history of philosophy appeared as the problem of intentionality. Brains do represent their own rep uh, directedness to practical gold states or to intentional objects. And this point led me into long um, cooperations, for instance, with Vittorio Gallese in Italy, the people who have researched mirror neurons, because if you look into the brain, um, <clears throat> and if you look really how things are um, represented there, you see that an object in the brain for instance, is often represented as a set of possible grasping movements. So the, and, and so on and so forth, you know, the brain actually doesn't represent isolated objects. They are always related to a, the motor repertoire of an embodied organism in the coding strategy itself. And so I've done a lot of uh, research on that, but my slightly subversive idea is, is that if you, for instance, you attend to the screen right now, even if you don't think you have a phenomenology, you represent attentional directedness. The arrow of attention is actually represented in your mind. And I think that is what Brentano actually tried to ex explicate. So Brentano turned a phenomenological element, say the phenomenology of attention as being directed to a visual object or something like this, into a theoretical problem, which influenced many of us for more than 100 years. And you also see it in Husserl. Husserl, for instance, has this notion of Blickstrahl der Aufmerksamkeit of the pure ego set that there is a, a ray glance of attention out of the pure ego. And I think what actually happened is the human brain had this first <laughs> centuries ago. This is how it, on its user surface, explained that it knows and understands things to itself. It's its own model of what Carl Friston today calls the optimization of precision expectations. It had its own model of that. And then centuries later, philosophers came and turned this to a, a theoretical problem. So, yeah. yeah, and that's what it means to have a first person perspective. If you have a model of the intentionality relationship in your brain active right now, then you experience yourself as being directed at the world through an individual first-person perspective, um, which of course is a neurocomputational fact and a phenomenological fact. And as such, it doesn't say anything about the epistemological and metaphysical questions that follow. But mm -hmm. I'll stop again. <laughs> right. <laughs> So uh, I would like to move now to AI and the ethics of it. So when it comes to questions related to the ethics of AI, what would you say are the most pressing issues we have to address? Hmm, that's a very good question. Again, a personal note. So I have just a very interesting learning experience behind me. So I was nominated into this a European Commission's high-level expert group on AI and from 2018 to 2020 I went to Brussels and trying to develop the European Union's guidelines for trustworthy AI and now I would say the most difficult the, the most pressing problem is uh, the industrial lobby 
um, that uh, undermines democratic institutions in Brussels and in Berlin everywhere. And I was completely unaware as a philosopher um, how, um, how forceful this is. In Brussels, there are 15,000 people who have jobs um, and apartments as industrial lobbyists trying to influence that what the European people actually wanted doesn't happen. And uh, the same thing you have for artificial intelligence. So the people who have an interest, say the five big American companies to postpone legal regulation and ethical rules for AI, they like people like you and me to have ethical debates on AI because as long as these ethical debates run, it buys them time. You know, they can conquer and develop markets, they can implement the technologies. So as a philosopher, that's just the introduction, you can be a really useful idiot uh, if you um, uh, take part in debates on artificial intelligence because uh, it buys the industry time and in the end, the lobby is going to neutralize everything you say in the final process um, of creating laws. It's a very difficult situation. But I don't want to evade your question. So standard problem is lethal autonomous weapon systems. Um, I'm just naming some problems. Uh, um, so we are in great danger of having a historically new um, level of the arms race above nuclear arms. It has already begun between China and the US, and we are on a slippery slope to much more autonomous military applications of AI. This has many practical consequences. Uh, the threshold to enter a war will get lower in the future with these weapons because politicians don't have to explain dead soldiers to their own population and just destroy material. The danger of escalation <clears throat> is higher because reaction times, response times in these new military systems always become smaller, which means that you gradually have to take humans out of the loop. With these battlefields of the future, with these very modern weapon systems, and you cannot ring the general at quarter to three at night and ring him out of bed to ask him um, something then you've lost the war. If the other side has autonomous weapon systems too, you have to, I don't know how do you say that in English, I guess relinquish control is the word. You have to gradually give human autonomy into these weapon systems and it's rational to do that. But that goes into a direction where these systems may escalate a local situation very quickly before humans can stop it. And we do know human beings make mistakes in military decisions, but machines make mistakes too. So we have risks of machine triggered uh, escalations uh, in the future. I think we should, our chances are slim, but we shouldn't get into this level of the arms race. I'll name another problem, total surveillance. China is the model. Mm -hmm. uh, there are 600 million cameras in public spaces in China with 1.3 billion citizens. This is a totalitarianism to zero rising um, there. Um, China has, in on the 4th of June, is had, it has how do you say, overtaken the US in research publications on AI. There's more research now in China than in, in the US. Um, nobody knows where this will lead against this totalitarian context. One of the many things I've learned in Brussels, which I had never thought before, is, is that until now, technological leadership and democracy on this planet have always gone hand in hand. This may change uh, in this century. If China wins the AI race on the planet, this can have many, many consequences. You know, uh, in 50 years, 
citizens in Portugal or Germany might ask, why do all these things work so much better in China? Why are they so much, why are my children Uber drivers for Chinese tourists? Something must be wrong with uh, democracy. So uh, we might have a um, spillover effect. Um, the third thing I want to name, as you probably know, and I have officially asked for a moratorium on synthetic phenomenology until 2050. This year I've published a paper to make this uh, official. I can only say the following thing, uh, we should not even get remotely close to the possibility of creating artificial consciousness unless we really know what we're doing there. And in my own community, in the conscious community, there are now four labs, highly esteemed colleagues of mine on the world, who say they will create artificial consciousness if they get a chance to do it. And I think we really shouldn't do this for a number of reasons. Uh, one of them uh, being that we might cause an explosion of artificial suffering on artificial carrier systems. But of course, uh, the problem, the, the process could get out of hand in many other ways. So in Brussels, it was absolutely impossible to get anything, let's not do artificial consciousness into the rules there, because everybody thinks, yeah, this is gaga science fiction. This will not happen soon. Um, I also don't think it will happen soon. I'm a consciousness researcher. I don't think we will have artificial consciousness tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. But my point is, I may be wrong. And <laughs> we should uh, really um, devote a lot of intellectual resources into this. So I think until 2050, we should have a ban on anybody and no funding for anybody who tries to create artificial consciousness on this planet. And um, because we just don't know what we're doing. But, but when it comes to the issue of artificial consciousness, and perhaps, I mean, this would be one of the reasons why many people do not worry too much about it. I mean, would we necessarily have to have a detailed understanding of what consciousness is and how it works? for we to for us to be able to recreate it in some sort of uh, artificial intelligent no. system no no of course we i mean we create uh, consciousness in human beings <laughs> without knowing how it works and there are many examples in the history of science and technology where human beings are using something um um say um transcranial direct stimulation for certain diseases, direct brain stimulation, um, say for people with uh, tics, that is, it's used in medicine. Nobody has a theory about how that technology works. So we do that many times. We apply something out of commercial greed um, or because we just try it out and we don't have a theory of how it works. And of course, we could, by chance, we could stumble in creating artificial phenomenality without understanding how we actually have done this. Uh, there are examples, um, for instance, if you look into the history of um, heavier than air flight, there were many philosophers who said this is in, princi in principle conceptually impossible, that there could be airplanes which are heavier than air that would ever fly. <laughs> and the thing is, four years after the Wright brothers had demonstrated it is possible with an airplane, there were still people in Europe who would say this is conceptually impossible. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we don't have to be afraid airplanes will never exist. And there are some examples, I think, also um, with building nuclear bombs with nuclear um, fission, uh, where the experts it's themselves, when asked by journalists, would say, come on, never will this work. 
maybe in five years. And they said this six months before they had the breakthrough and invented it. So sometimes the fact that AI professors all say, now, come on, artificial consciousness, 70 years maybe towards the end of the century, doesn't mean anything because the history of science is sometimes it's faster. You know, the Taliban were also faster than any, everybody else. And it could well be that the tipping points in the climate crisis, crisis also are faster uh, than anybody actually thought. Something like this might uh, apply to the evolution of artificial intelligence. I hope not. Right, but, but I mean, when it comes to this issue of artificial intelligence, is it an issue in the sense that we have to be careful about the ways we deal and treat these artificial systems that might develop certain types of mental experiences? Or would it, could it be also a risk for us humans? Well, these are two questions, of course. Uh, um, one is the ethical question. The other is just, um, so to speak, practical, um, ego, egotistic intelligence. I think the risks do not come from scientific, science fiction, autonomous intelligence that turns against us. The real risk comes from the combination of our stone age minds with advanced technology. And it doesn't have to be science fiction uh, um, uh, technology. The real risk is here today. Human minds, as they come out of biological evolution, combined with state-of-the-art computer technology, that is super dangerous. We don't have to wait for some, you know, um, intelligence explosion taking us over. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, the current risks are already big. I'll just name one. Um, if anybody hasn't seen that film, The Social Dilemma by Tristan Harris and its colleagues, now freely available on YouTube, uh, which was on Netflix, social media with more than 3 billion users on the planet are optimized by AI 24 hours a day, seven hours a day. There is now an industry that extracts attention from human brains packages it and sells it to customers for advertisement. We can see it in young people. Uh, the technology is already changing our minds dramatically, our attention spans and all this. This is happening now. It's not a science fiction scenario. It's AI driven, AI optimized um, social media, change human beings. Um, so, yeah. Enough about this. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, also because we're almost reaching our time limit, just one last question. But uh, would it be possible for us to be sure that a particular AI system is conscious? No. Uh, if we do not have a theory of consciousness, um, we um, cannot make that decision. What we would need would be um, hardware independent criteria for the instantiation of phenomenal properties. And we do not have uh, these criteria. There might, for instance, as Margaret Bowden has long said, there might be something like a metabolism constraint. It could be that phenomenal experience for some computational reason we haven't fully understood yet can only emerge on you know real biological systems with a metabolism of their own. Maybe that's a necessary condition. And another possibility is most people always think um, uh, conscious and unconscious is um, a distinction that is exhaustive and exclusive. But maybe we discover uh, we create a third thing. Nobody something new. Uh, that is ethically relevant. Nobody has thought about it. 
-hmm. a hybrid form of semi-phenomenal intelligence or whatever. It is also possible that we do create phenomenal experience in systems and don't discover it because it is so alien to us and we don't have a theory that we only understand 20 years later what we have already done. So the short answer is, of course, that is, by the way, that is why consciousness research is so important and more research uh, resources should be put into it because we need better criteria to decide which animals on this planet are able to suffer and when would machine suffering start? And these are urgent questions. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, so uh, Dr. Metzinger, before we go, would you like to tell people where they can find your work on the internet? Oh, I have an English and a German website and there's a Google Scholar page. Um, it's easy to find. Okay, so uh, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you. You're quite welcome. Thank you very much. I enjoyed this. Hi guys, thank you for watching this interview until the end. If you like what I'm doing, please consider supporting the channel. It's thanks to people like you that it keeps running. So I will leave links in the description box for PayPal and Patreon. Any amount, even just $1 per month would already be a great help. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share the interview, leave a like and hit the subscription button. This show is brought to you by Enlights Learning and Development Done Differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like, like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and supporters, Karen Litzke, and Blanchett, Perga, Larson, Laurero, Francis Ford, Enz, Frederick Sunda, Ricardo Vladimir, Craig Healy, Adam Castle, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Vissel, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Enrique Lenny, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Ruth Gervoz, Bo Weingard, Rebecca Neuberger Goldstein, Dan Demetri, Robert Windegger, Rui Nassi, Arthur Coe, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Thomas Trumbull, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Columbus, Jorge Pinha, Phil Cavana, Corey Clark, Mark Life, Roberto Nguanzo, Mikkel Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Yugni, Alexander Dunbauer, Omari Hickson, Fergal Cusson, Evan Bodrenko, Al Herzog, Don Ross, Jonathan Lybrand, Oslin Bullut, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W., João Weira, Tom Hummel, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Dez Araújo, Eden Solon, Romain Roach, Dmitry Grigoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roth, Yannick Punter, Adana Ruzmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostasevsky, Nelek Bach, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Al Ortiz, Guy Madison, Gary G. Elman, João Linhares, Lida Cosmides, Saima Afzal, Adrian Yegi, Nick Golden, Paulo Tolentino, João Barbosa, Jules Price, Edward Hall. My producers, Isar Webb, Jim Frank, Lucas Tafinia, Kian Gilligan, Luis Caetano, Tom Venegdam, Curtis Dixon, João Linhares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Gidi, Sardas France, Niruban Balachandran, and my executive producers, Michel Rugieski, Rosie, James Pratt, Matthew Lavender, and Sergio Codriano. Thank you for all.